So, Assalamu alaikum everyone. Today we are going to start a new topic, uh, which is about the beginning of life at the stage of fertilization. So, very interesting topic indeed. Can you all see my screen? So this is the beginning of life in uh, organisms which reproduce sexually. This is a cartoon which is showing that, you know, a massive number of sperm cells, all these are sperms with tails, are attacking the oocyte during the process of fertilization. And the beauty is that only one of the sperm out of these hundreds and thousands of sperms is going to be successful to initiate the zygotic development. So these two are very specialized cells, oocyte and oocyte is your egg cell, haploid, sperm cell, haploid. The two haploids during this process of fertilization, they become a diploid and that's where this cell then divides to make two diploids and so on, they keep dividing, okay? And that's how our development starts, zygotic development starts. As I said, these are very specialized cells. Why they are specialized cells? Because these are the two cells which has the potential to develop or make a complete new organism. You take a skin cell, you take any other cell in our body that cannot contribute to development of a complete new organism. So, In a way, they are the ones which are responsible for continuity of the life. There's a very interesting theory in, in, in 60s and 70s, I believe I read some papers uh, of that time. And it was about that a human body is just a vehicle. It is just, you know, we are basically a vehicle for continuity of the life and our job is to pass on the sperm or the oocyte so that life continues. And because, and it, it, in a way it's true because the continuity of the life, it actually relies on these two cell types. But of course, I, I differ with that theory <laughs> that we are here just to pass on the sperm and the oocytes to, to, for the continuity of the life. These cells are separated from the rest of the uh, cells in our body at very early stage during development. Uh, and they, at early embryonic development, <clears throat> they divide very slow. <clears throat> there are less cell divisions. And another distinguishing feature is that these are the only cells which undergo meiosis. All the other cells we harbor in our body, billions of cells we have, more than 200 different cell types we have in our body. 
they all divide mitotically. Now, they are the ones which divide, they undergo less divisions and they undergo meiosis. It means there is very specialized mechanism to keep their meiotic division slow. Uh, and we will cover all this in today's lecture as well, why it is so. Now, the point is, who are the original cells which contribute to development of these specialized cell types? And these cells are called PGCs, primordial germ cells. We call them PGCs. These are basically originally diploid cells. And these are germline precursor cells. And they are formed, these PGCs are formed at very sp specialized location within the developing embryo. And they are protected from mitotic signals. They are protected from inductive signals because they are diploids. They can, if they receive, they will receive uh, inductive signal to divide mitotically, they may uh, become somatic cells as well. So they are restricted or protected in a very, very specialized region within a developing embryo. So today's lecture is all about how the germ cells are specified and set aside in early embryo and how germ cells differentiate into eggs and sperms eventually. Okay. So we will learn about these two concepts in today's lecture. So how they are specified? Let's tackle the first question. How they are specified at early embryonic development? Actually, they are very specialized or sp specific cytoplasmic determinants in the egg cell. Already in the egg cell, I'm saying. Okay. And later on in the lectures, we'll see in fly, there are some specific maternal genes and nematode there is also uh, then there are p granules etc so <clears throat> these cytoplasmic determinants uh, we refer to it as germplasm uh, germplasm is nothing but just a very special kind of cytoplasm that specifies the primordial germ cells so the poleplasm or in poleplasm in, in fly, germplasm generally in other organisms, it contains specific cytoplasmic determinants, which is going to specify PGCs. Now, in case of fruit fly, Drosophila melanogaster, you remember we said that at nearly 90 minutes after fertilization, which is more than an hour before the cellularization, which means still, while embryo is still a syncytium, syncytium, at that particular stage, the cells which are going to contribute to future germ cells, they are separated. They become distinct. And we call those cells, you remember, we call them pole cells in our earlier lectures. And these pole cells, they, if you remember our earlier lectures, we had like, you know, we could visibly see a membranous or a region, a very transparent region. And we said, this is the location where pole cells at the most posterior end are separated. And this is the region which has the pole plasma which is responsible for specifying these future germ cells here. So <clears throat> pole plasma at the posterior pole in fruit fly, it's distinguished, and uh, this region is distinguished by the presence of specific large polar gra granules. There are, if you <clears throat> try to observe there at that particular stage, you will see some granules. And these polar granules, they contain basically specific proteins and messenger RNA. Some maternally contributed uh, 
genes as well. Now, what is the proof that there is pole plasma? How can we do an experiment? How can we design an experiment and validate the existence of pole plasma or pole cells? Let's say we have two flies. Uh, one is of P genotype, the other is of Y genotype. If we simply take at early embryonic development, it's in CTM stage, if we transplant the pole plasm and inject it at the anterior region in Y genotype uh, embryo. So the anterior cells containing the pole plasm, uh, which was transplanted, so now, pole plasm here in the Y genotype, we will take the anterior cells of this one and transplant them at the posterior of another genotype, which is G. Now remember, these are what? Here, these are basically the bicoid region. This is the head region, future head region. This is the somatic cells, supposed to be somatic cells. When we look at the progeny of this individual, which contain the interior cells of Y, which are, were exposed to the pole plasma of P, the adult fly, it develops germ cells with same genotype as of why? It will have its own germ cells as well as it will have germ cells of Y genotype. What is so? What has happened? The pole plasm, the cytoplasmic determinants of P, they specified these cells as germ cells. When we took these cells transplanted in the G, there are G's own pole cells as well as the pole cells of now Y, which were this one, these ones. So it means, so what this proves that at the most posterior end, at syncytium stage at 90 minutes, there is very, very specialized cytoplasm or pole plasm, <clears throat> which has the potential, <clears throat> sorry. <clears throat> which has the potential to <clears throat> specify pole cell. <clears throat> There's another experiment you can simply do, you can take you can use UV radiation and expose this region in a very uh, specific way. You just ablate or destroy this region so all the pole plasma is exposed to UV. And then you see development of uh, future progeny of this embryo. And what you see, you don't get future progeny because no germ cells develop. So it again proves that uh, the pole plasm contains specific determinants. Let's look at other organisms other than fruit fly. This is C. elegans. And in case of C. elegans, we have uh, the female pronucleus, the male pronucleus. So this is just the stage where fertilization is taking place. So the two male and female nuclei, they fertilize, uh, fuse. And now you can see these yellow ones, which we know as P granules. They are asymmetrically, so after the mitotic division, after fusion of the male and female pronuclei, the first cell division is already asymmetrical. 
it's not equal because all the cytoplasmic P granules, they are passed on to the first uh, cell, P1. The other one is AB. If you just look at here, this is the P0, the, this cell, which is the for, uh, after fusion of male and female uh, pronuclei. This is the P1, which is inheriting all the P granules. Uh, all the somatic cells in nematode are product of AB cell. This big cell is going to divide and contribute to all the somatic cells. However, these P granule containing cell P1, we also call them P blastomeres, they undergo four cell divisions, four stem cell-like cell division, again, asymmetrical. So one of the cell will inherit all the P granule, the, uh, so unequal cell division. <clears throat> P2 will again divide. One will be like uh, P granule containing cell. The other one will be going to contribute to somatic cells. Here also the EMS will contribute to somatic cells. Then the final P4 is going to again divide asymmetrically, but the P4 is all the germ cells in nematode, they originate from the P4 blastomere. Now, yeah, I explained you this, that the each cell division of these P1, P2, P3 are like stem cells, they are unequal uh, or asymmetrical. And what they are actually inheriting, they are inheriting P granules, and P granules, uh, they contain PGL proteins, uh, which are necessary for germ cell division. So these granules, they actually <clears throat> contain <clears throat> already before fusion of male and female pronuclei, you can see there are already cytoplasmic determinants which are directed to specific cell and these granules contain uh, proteins and in fruit fly they contain uh, the pole plasm also contain some maternally contributed mrna as well <clears throat> so one of the p granule protein is pi1 in nematode uh, and this one pi1 maintains the stem cell identity of plastomeres so this is a stem cell identity dividing asymmetrically uh, again here you will have pi1 so asymmetrically dividing pi1 asymmetrical dividing and then all the uh, products of p4 they will are the primordial germ cells or the ones which are going to contribute to uh, future germ cells pi1 is maternally expressed and it's normally not component of p granules uh, the job of pi1 is to repress the transcription of zygotic genes till 100 cell stage. So you will have pi1 uh, here, and it will repress expression or transcription of the zygotic genes because zygotic genes, expression of zygotic gene means they will be most likely uh, contributing to somatic cells. So let's look at another organism, a frog, how the germ cell uh, specification takes place at early embryonic stages. So you remember uh, during our earlier lectures, we learned that, you know, you have frog oocyte is quite big. You have uh, animal pole and vegetal pole. And most of the time, the vegetal pole and the ventral side has the yolk. However, there are uh, <clears throat> distinct yolk free patches of uh, cytoplasmic aggregate in this region in the vegetal pole. Okay, uh, there is yolk, but there are distinct yolk free regions here. And <clears throat> You remember uh, after fertilization, when the cleavage division start, we learned that the yolk, it restricts the cleavage divisions and contributes to asymmetric distribution of cytoplasm. 
and that is basically uh, <clears throat> onset of uh, specification of germ cells so most of the cytoplasmic uh, <clears throat> determinants they are retained here in the uh, vegetal daughter cells and they then give rise to the germ cells if you can expose if you expose the this particular region with uv radiation <clears throat> the germ cells are abolished it means there are specific specialized cytoplasmic determinants which contribute to specification of future germ cells if you transplant so in this embryo in which you exposed with uv radiation uh, and all the future germ cells uh, were ablated if you transplant cytoplasm from a normal embryo in this one where you so you restore the development of germ cells so this actually indicates that the cytoplasmic determinants are the ones which specify germ cells in case of mouse um, there is no indication that we have uh, germ plasm there is no evidence that there is specialized germ plasm which is involved in specification of the germ cell how do we know this because uh, if you take uh, embryonic stem cells and inject so these are the embryonic stem cells you take them and you inject them at early blastocyst stage where you know uh, we have uh, the big cavity uh, fluid filled cavity uh, we have these uh, trophoblast uh, cells which are the extra embryonic and then we have this inner cell mass the disc shaped cells if you transplant embryonic stem cells of a different genotype what we see these uh, cells they contribute to not only the somatic cells but also they can contribute to germ cells as well it means you know there is no uh, evidence that you know you have very very specialized germ plasm which uh, exposure to which you need uh, you exposure to which will decide the fate of the uh, future germ cells however if there is no such germ cell then how germ cells in case of mouse are specified in case of mouse uh, primordial germ cells uh, the pgcs uh, they are first identified midway through the gastrulation you remember gastrulation uh, we watched uh, i believe we watched a video as well in the idea lecture the gastrulation in in vertebrates is coincides with or, or the one of the visible signs of gastrulation is the primitive streak where you know uh, we see large scale cell movements um, and you know there is a uh, along the anterior posterior axis of the embryo we see uh, a streak uh where cells are actually moving inwards at that particular stage we see the first indication of formation of primordial germ cells this is uh, the six day after fertilization in mouse uh, this is the epiblast uh, extra embryonic ectoderm then the visual endoderm now this is the time uh, 7.25 day post fertilization and this is the primitive streak you can see uh, the sign of uh, primitive streak this is the stage where we see uh, primordial germ cells and these primordial germ cells become even more visible by eighth day of uh, after fertilization where they are indicated by presence of proteins so there are two proteins one is fragilis so the dark blue color is the one which is uh, expressing high uh, fragilis okay 
and then there are cells or uh, region where we detect very low fragilis. And within the core of high expressing high fragilis domain, we have another protein which is called Stella. So both fragilis and Stella. Now, fragilis is a protein which is, you know, like, like uh, which um, contributes to aggregation more stronger cell to cell connections or cell become uh, more strongly connected with each other so primordial germ cells uh, they once they are here they start now you can see they are moving this arrow indicates their movement and they migrate to the posterior end of the primitive streak uh, while they are expressing the high levels of fred Fragilis. Fragilis is basically a transmembrane protein. It's involved in aggregation and later on separation of the other cells. Uh, also, once you have the fragilis, I told you the other proteins are Stella, Oct4, and uh, alkaline phosphatase. We'll get back to this uh, PGCs in mouse in a moment. Uh, where we'll talk about uh, the migration of these cells and from where they start their migration and how they arrive at their future destination, which is the gonads. We'll come there in a moment, but let's go back to the uh, now fruit fly, the localization of poleplasm at the posterior end in drosophila. So what is contributing to the localization of pole plasm at the posterior end? There are at least eight genes, at least eight known genes. When they are homozygous mutant uh, fruit flies, they lack grandchildren. There are several maternal genes involved in the pole plasm formation. For example, one is uh, Oscar. Oscar is uh, involved in central, the, it plays a central role in organization and formation of pole plasm. Oscar, uh, the localization of Oscar uh, at the posterior pole plasm, it relies on its three prime UTI. And there is a protein called Staufen. Staufen is a protein which localizes Oscar messenger RNA at the posterior pole, at the pole plasma. And this is through linking. So Staufen protein, it links the mRNA for Oscar with the microtubule system at the most posterior end, which is the pole blast. How do we know that the three prime UTR of Oscar is very important? So what they do, what they did, they a beautiful experiment. So we have Bicoid gene and what they did, they took three prime UTR region containing Bicoid localization signal. They replaced the Oscar three prime UTR with Bicoid. Now, what they saw, the transgenic flies, when they laid eggs, the Oscar was localized at the anterior. And this is the normal maternally contributed Oscar. This is the transgene one. Now, this highlights the role of three prime UTR. That if the Oscar gene loses its three prime UTR, or it's coding all the reading frame is intact, the three prime UTR is replaced. And look, it's localized there. What is the consequence? The consequence is due to localization of Oscar at the posterior pole, you see here 
development of pole cells. These are the normal pole cells due to uh, the wild type products of Oscar, etc. But localization of Oscar at the anterior end contributes to development of uh, pole cells in the in the formation of pole plasm, uh, pole cells at the anterior end. So this is a beautiful experiment. Is it clear so far? You haven't asked any question or? Sir, um, can I ask a question? Please go ahead. So um, you just mentioned that the uh, presence of Os Oscar at the anterior side, it's uh, resulting in the presence of the pole cells as well. It's just a simple thing that's coming to my mind. Is it these pole cells, are they like being equally divided between the two, um, you know, anterior and posterior parts, region? Like... Um, what do you mean equally divided? So basically, you, um, you know, in the previous slide, you mentioned, <clears throat> sorry. So you mentioned that the pole, pole cells, they're basically uh, moving towards the uh, posterior part, like either um, asymmetrically moving initially after the fertilization. So uh, after the fusion. So uh, but my question is that where are these pole cells coming from then? No, 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 no. This is fruit fly. That was uh, nematode, C. elegans where okay. P granules asymmetrically are distributed. Here the, in the fruit fly embryo, what we learned that, you know, maternally contributed genes, uh, and here we are learning about Oscar, Stauffen, and there are at least eight known genes. They are contributing to the formation of this uh, pole plasm and eventually the pole cells. Now, this experiment proves that just bringing an Oscar here at the anterior side is contributing to the pole cells formation. It means Oscar must be attracting something else as well. Okay. 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 Thank you. Any other question? Okay. Now, I told you... Does Bicard move towards the other axis as well if it gets the Oscar 3 prime UTR? Yeah, it will. It will. Definitely. Because the localization of Oscar is also, uh, sorry, the Bicard is also due to its 3 prime UTR. Look, Bicard localization signal. These are messenger RNAs which are anchored on specific locations in the embryo. Uh, I told you we are going, we'll come back to uh, the movement of uh, PGCs, primordial germ cells uh, in, in mouse, which is a very interesting phenomenon. So uh, site of production uh, of germ cells is usually away from the gonads. They are not formed right there where their future uh, location is supposed to be. Uh, germ cells, they uh, originate, they are specified at, uh, at a specific position, and then they move or migrate uh, to the place where future gonads are. Nobody knows the real uh, reason. Of course, we are totally naive uh, structure as embryo. There, there are no specialized cell types at that particular stage. There's the whole uh, um, stage of organogenesis, uh, differentiation followed by organogenesis is yet to start. So that could be a reason, but uh, they propose that, you know, this migration <coughs> or uh, the movement or traveling from place of origin to future gonads is actually a selection mechanism for uh, healthy PGCs. The ones which will survive this movement, it means they are healthy and they are going to contribute to 
future generations and the ones which are not healthy they will somehow fizzle out or be destroyed uh, while migrating um, in xenopus the pgc's they originate in the endoderm uh, which forms gut and then they migrate to future gonad and cells they divide three times before their arrival so all the pgc's which are formed from uh, endoderm they before they arrive at their final destination which are the gonads they divide three times as we learned in the earlier part of the lecture uh, the germ cells they divide very little uh, in their early embryonic development in mouse uh, pgc's they arrive at the genital ridge uh, and there are almost 8000 uh, the ones which arrive there uh, and they start from 45 a colony of 45 cells um, at the time <clears throat> uh, when the primitive streak is formed and they uh, <clears throat> these uh, cells they migrate in this what we know as uh, genital ridge uh, and this movement is very interesting so there are two genes which are involved in their proliferation and migration in this genital ridge to before they eventually arrive at the uh, their destination so one gene is called whitening spot and the other is called steel whitening spot is a receptor kit uh, which is expressed in migrating cells okay so all the migrating cells which are primordial germ cells they are expressing whitening spot gene the protein is called kit uh, and steel is the ligand uh, which is expressed along the germ cells as they migrate so in this ridge if they migrate as sorry as they move so you can imagine the pgc will have kit receptor and along the path along this journey as they are rolling or migrating the ligand is here which is steel so it looks like a a, a directed movement uh, taking them to their future uh, direct uh, destination in uh, chicks um the primordial germ cells they originate at the head region so the region which makes head of the chicks that's where primordial germ cells originate uh, they then travel through the blood vessels uh, and arrive at the destination which is the gonads is it clear so far <clears throat> so now we are going to look at the formation of um, pgc's and then the uh, their division through meiosis to form either oocytes or uh, spermatocytes as we earlier talked about the uh, pgc's are actually diploids Uh, and they undergo meiosis to form either uh, egg or the sperm cells the journey starts here uh, that primordial germ cells uh, they proliferate during migration and this proliferation is mitotic as they are moving towards gonads so when they move uh from their 
site of origin uh, towards uh, their destination, which are the gonads, they are slowly dividing mitotically. And eventually uh, they enter into meiosis and this entry into meiosis um, is just the primary, if we talk about uh, the oocyte, it's just, you know, they enter into meiosis and then they are arrested at the prophase one, prophase one of meiosis. All this is happening, so this should be thought provoking for you. Meiosis in human females, in mammalian females, the egg formation, it starts already when they are, you know, uh, in mother's womb and they are like, uh, you know, just few cell stage. We, we saw the, um, uh, in case of mouse, the primitive streak uh, and the uh, movement of PGCs. However, once they get arrested at prophase one of meiosis, then they never proliferate again. They remain arrested. And so this cartoon is going to show you, this is the primordial germ cell, which is multiplying or proliferating during its migration. As soon as it enters the ovary, the some mitotic divisions uh, of oogonia within the ovary takes place. However, uh, then there are no more uh, further divisions, but they enter meiosis and they are arrested here, right here in the prophase one of meiosis. They never divide again. They remain arrested. So this also gives us an idea that already at the time of birth, you have a fixed number of cells and you can calculate how many oocytes will be produced by a female in certain number of years. Does it make sense what I'm saying? This arrest of meiosis, it is, so which we call the, at this stage we call oocyte as primary oocyte. And this arrest is released when the females become adult. And what we see then the, at the stage of ovulation, we have completion of division one of meiosis. You know, we divide meiosis into meiosis one and meiosis two. Meiosis one is the reductional division where chromosomes are halved. And then the second meiosis is just a, a kind of mitotic division. Now at the ovulation stage, the first meiosis gets completed. And at this stage, we call this secondary oocyte. We have, as a result of this completion of first meiosis, we have two cells now, and we have one polar body, the other is, which is going to serve as oocyte. Again, it remain arrested now and it only completes meiosis after the fertilization when the sperm fuses now after fertilization what we see we have the second polar body uh, and the uh, after fertilization what we see 
the sperm nucleus enter entering into the oocyte where the two haploid genomes then fuse with each other and we have formation of a diploid cell a single nucleus so total number of uh, i already told you the total number of oocytes at at this stage in embryo is generally considered to be the total number of eggs a female will ever produce um, most degenerate before puberty so um, normally the total number of oocytes you have is uh, 40000 uh, out of an initial number of 6 million and also there is another point that once females mature sexually uh, the oocyte further develops in size there is a thousand fold increase in the size of the oocyte but then it gets arrested in uh, at secondary oocyte stage or metaphase of second meiosis okay so when it arrests uh, after uh, completion of first meiosis uh, after ovulation it so before fertilization it is actually arrested at second metaphase stage okay how uh, similar process takes place in males so you have uh, migration of the uh, pgcs uh, primordial germ cells they and during migration they are also very slowly dividing mitotically indeed they enter the gonads in the testes and they get arrested in g1 uh, of the cell cycle after birth uh, what you see you have now uh, still a diploid spermatogonia which multiplies by mitosis in testes and this division involves a stem cell like division where you know uh, one cell will produce another stem cell which will remain diploid which will keep producing itself asymmetrical cell division and the other one it enters into meiosis once it enters into meiosis so the spermatocyte it passes through meiosis one meiosis one is the one when you have reduction of the chromosomes and then eventually meiotis, meiosis two the end result of meiosis is so these two cells are going to divide equally like mitosis and we have haploid cells in contrast to the females where we have one diploid cell entering into meiosis and eventually we have a single oocyte and the rest of the three cells are degenerated like first polar body here degenerated the other one also degenerated and only a single cell remains as oocyte in case of males they are less economical they you know they go uh, each product of meiosis it acts as a, a sperm cell the spermatids they mature as a sperm cell each sperm cell has potential to fertilize the oocyte Yeah, I told you that here, once the PGC divides a second germ cell, it do not enter into meiosis in embryo. Uh, and, you know, they arrest at an early stage of mitotic cell. Only after the birth, uh, mitosis resumes and, you know, you have a stem cell like division. This is very useful in males because, you know, you have unlike females you have a continuous source of sperm production uh, you don't have a fixed number of uh, sperms uh, you, what you have you have a primordial germ cell undergoing stem cell like division where you will have you know 
uh, a continuous source of future uh, spermatocytes. So this is what we saw. We saw that uh, in case of uh, Drosophila, in case of C. elegans, uh, Xenopus, uh, we didn't talk about zebra fish, but uh, it, they all have specialized germplasm. And we did talk about uh, Oscar and Stauffen in case of Drosophila, in case of uh, C. elegans, we talked about uh, P. granules and Pi1 protein, which play a role in the germplasm. And then in uh, Xenopus, we talked about, you know, uh, specialized uh, granules, yolk free region, which uh, contribute to the germplasm. But in mammals, uh, there's no evidence of uh, a role of germplasm or existence of germplasm. I want to leave you with an uh, assignment because what we have talked about today is actually a process of fertilization. But this germ cell formation, germ cells formation, when you start from 2N, which is a PGC, and you are going to produce four haploid cells. All four can be sperm cells, or you have a PGC, a 2N, and then through meiosis, it produces uh, one and uh, oocyte, uh, as we learned, all three uh, other polar bodies are degenerated. And then these, the sperm cell, and so one N and one N of oocyte, they fuse with each other to make a diploid zygote. This is not only the beginning of life, but this is also the stage. This, when this meiosis takes place, and when this meiosis is taking place. This is also the stage where resetting of the genome takes place. Or let's say reprogramming of the genome. What do you mean by reprogramming of the genome? There is something happening in the genome of these particular cells that only these cells can contribute to development of a complete organism and a skin cell cannot. While the formation of germ cells when I say reprogramming of the genome or resetting of the genome is taking place, of course, one, cons one, one of the conclusion is we are going to have 23 chromosomes here in humans. No more 46. 23 and 23. But that's not end of the reprogramming or resetting. There's a phenomenon called genome imprinting. What happens during genome imprinting, and it was discovered uh, that it's conserved in plants, it's conserved in mammals. It's a very strange phenomenon that when after fertilization, so one end of sperm and one end of oocyte, it made, makes zygote. In this zygote, there are nearly 200 genes which are expressed in parent of origin manner, parent of origin manner. Parent of origin manner means only one, so each 2N means each chromosome is existing in 
along with its homolog. Genes are in pairs. However, these 200 or so genes, only one copy is going to be expressed in life of this future male or female. It will depend, and these genes are marked. They are imprinted. These genes are imprinted or marked. So for example, uh, there is an example here. So this is a zygote. And this zygote is going to express insulin growth factor 2 gene, which is father's copy and mother's copies of. And just a gene lying next to it, H19, it is imprinted in such a way that father's copy is off and only mother's copy is on. So in all of us, in all humans, we all, whether you are a female or you are male, our only father's copy is active and mother's copy is off. And H19, our father's copy is off and our mother's copy is on. How do we know this? How we selectively switch on here, this we call paternally imprinted, maternally imprinted. How do we know this? How, how do we achieve this? This happens here. A question arises. Okay, this zygote is a male it develops as male individual. Now, it has these IGF-2 and H19 in imprinted form. But when the PGCs of this one will undergo meiosis and produce one and sperms, how are we going to pass on these two? Because in males, in all these cells of this individual, this individual had IGF-2 on from its father and H19 from its mother. And this is how the PGCs, which are diploid, they must be having this genome. Now, when the, the PGC is there, before they enter into meiosis, they undergo reprogramming. And what they do, they reset. Because now, all these cells are going to be of male origin. The IGF-2 and H19 locus in these PGCs, they're going to be marked, imprinted in such a way that IGF-2 will be kept on and these male sperms, they will have their H19 in the off state. And imagine we have female which grew now its PGC before it enters into meiosis and produces this oocyte. This female PGC will reprogram in such a way that after meiosis, so this PGC will reset the genome in such a way that it will turn off. It will turn off the IGF-2 in the oocyte, the haploid, and it will imprint, imp, and imp, I'll soon explain you the imprints. It will imprint the H19 in such a way that after fertilization, when the zygote is formed, the zygote already knows 
regardless of my sex, whether I'm going to be male or female, my IGF-2 from my father's copy is going to be active and H19 of my father's copy is going to be off. And my mother's copy, the chromosome, which I inherit from my mother, there only H19 will be on and IGF-2 will be off. Now, how these imprints, they are achieved. So in next lecture, we are going to talk about, you know, uh, the process of fertilization. Okay, uh, these are for next lecture. But today, I'm going to leave you with an assignment in which you are going to go and read about genomic imprinting. Genomic imprinting you have to you have let's say today is thursday by next thursday you bring back genomic imprinting assignment max two pages focus on let's focus on igf2 and h19 imprinting and you are going to tell us what are imprints how imprinting is achieved. Two questions, what are the imprints? It means you have to bring the, tell us the nature of the imprints and how this imprinting, if the imprints are there, how this imprinting is achieved, how in the zygote, the genomic imprinting is maintained, okay? Is the question clear? And once you will answer these questions, you will definitely answer what is role of epigenetics in imprinting okay what is role of imprinting uh, what is role of epigenetics in genomic imprinting everything in the context of igf2 and h19 is it clear any question any question so if there are no more question Thank you, everyone. Um, today, I'm going to send you the uh, research papers by day and today. This recitation, we have a recitation today and we will again cover the tools and methods. And it, it will further, you know, clarify some more uh, functional genomics tools and developmental tools. They will help you understand the research papers and the kind of question we saw in our last lecture where we took, you know, um, uh, a homeotic transformation uh, mutant and then we tried to characterize that mutant. So today in the evening, we will have uh, our regular recitation. Okay. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? So if there are no more questions, then I wish you all a good day and I look forward to see you in the evening in visitation.